Greetings in the awesome, wonderful, and magnificent name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Welcome into the Tuesday night edition of MTV's live face, Facebook live broadcast. I am thankful to God for another opportunity to come to you by way of social media. I am grateful to each of you who tune in, as they say back in the day, much obliged. Ms. Gracie, Gracie Talbert, good evening to you. Uh, Deacon Carl Brown, good evening to you, my brother. I trust that God is moving miraculously in your life and you're walking in the favor of God. The ushers are checking in, Deacon checking in, Miss Enette Reese and all of our friends down 29, good evening to you, my younger brother, Reverend Marvin Brown. Good evening to you, my brother. Um, on, what a, on this <laughs> thankful, oh my God, I just left the gym. On this thankful Tuesday, uh, Miss Patricia Epps, good evening to you. Evangelist Teresa Thomas, uh, good evening to you also. Miss Eltoya Toils Wilson, good evening to you, Taz. Good evening to you. My uh, younger sister is in the house, Miss Janice Woodard. Didn't even know I had a sister until you know how, how it is when daddy died and, and uh, you, you realize you have other siblings and I'm, 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 I'm grateful. Uh, good evening to you. Um, what a mighty God we serve, Miss Carrie Patterson. Good evening to you, Reverend Snoop. Stinson, good evening to you, my brother. We'll give a few more people time to check in and I'll advertise for my sponsor. <laughs> I called it my sponsor. I'm wearing most of my bracelets today. If you like these bracelets, hit up Dr. Willie Mae Stokes. She makes them and um, I'm wearing most of them today. Um, what else? What else? Uh, remember... Uh, okay, let, let me give you some announcements. Ms. Margaret Bozeman, Evangelist Bozeman, good evening to you. Covenant Grace is in the house. Uh, third Sunday at 2 o'clock, we will be at uh, Antioch to help Reverend Norris celebrate his first pastoral anniversary. That's at 2 o'clock. Uh, and uh, mark your calendars. Uh, we are uh, matriculating our way. We always say that because... We teach on Tuesday night expository. Miss Marnetta Wilson, good evening to you. Also on Sunday morning, we are expository. We are, we, we, we are, we are, we are. Okay, Miss Benson, good evening to you. I am an expository preacher. And so we go line by line, verse by verse, precept by precept. We are making our way through John's gospel and I think this is the third uh, Kwanzaa, Lord Jesus, Kwanzaa, call your anthem and decide to come to Bible study. God bless you, Kwanzaa. Uh, we are making our way through the Gospel of John, so turn in your Bibles or your iPads or your uh, iPhone, whatever mechanism you use to study the Word of God. We're in John chapter number one, and we will not complete John. Yes, we will. Hopefully, we will complete John chapter one tonight. Johnny Dowdell, good evening to you. Dr. Colonel Tina Holloway, good evening to you. Remember that, uh, Ms. Annie Reese, that John is different from the first three Gospels. Um, they are called synoptic Gospels. Dr. Gina Jenning Borges, good evening to you. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic Gospels because they can be seen together. John is not a synoptic gospel because John cannot be seen in harmony or together with the rest. Jehiah, good evening to you with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, Matthew writes from a Jewish perspective. So if you're going to teach Matthew, you must understand something about the Jewish culture. If you're going to teach Mark, you must know something about the Roman culture because Mark was written to a Roman audience. If you're going to teach Luke, you must know something about the Greek audience because Luke 
Luke was written from a Greek perspective. John was written from a universal perspective. John was basically written to prove that Jesus is 100% man, but yet at the same time, he is 100% God. Miss Diane Harris Preston, good evening to you. A good friend from Bel Air, um, Jeffrey Ballard, good evening to you. John chapter number one, you remember Evangelist Frazier, John introduces us to the fact that Jesus is the Word, and the Word was made flesh, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John goes on in chapter one to talk about how he is a witness for the word which became flesh or Jesus. In chapter, he, he kept telling us in the previous verses that he is but a voice. Remember, we talked about John's purpose. John was uh, to prepare the hearts and the minds of people for the Messiah. John is considered the last Old Testament prophet. We explained that to you on last week. So now we're in John chapter uh, number one, verses 35 through 51. And here we will see the first five followers or disciples of Jesus. Those of you who are with us often understand that a disciple etymologically means a learner, a student, one who follows another's teaching. So we will find, we will discover Jesus's first five followers or disciples in the remainder of John chapter number one. Remember that John is the beloved, John the apostle is the writer of John of this particular gospel. And when John the baptizer came on the scene preaching in the wilderness, pointing to Jesus, putting people in the water. John gathered his own disciples, Ms. Renfro. John, these disciples were converted under the teachings of John. And in our text tonight, we will discover that two of John's disciples became the first two disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay, look at John 1, verse number 35. That's the backdrop. Again, the next day after John stood, we're reading in verse 35, and two of his disciples, I, I just explained to you that John had disciples. Even after Jesus came on the scene, he had no problem with Jesus, with John having students. I told you that when you see the word disciple, you can just substitute the word student. So John, John was standing there with two of his students or two of his disciples. Now, we, under, we know one of his disciples by verse number one of these uh, was Andrew. Now, theologians and uh, academicians all agree that the other disciple was John the apostle or the author of this particular passage of scripture. Now, I'm gonna take my time tonight because I need to explain this, this to you. Um, John, when he writes, never mentions himself by name. And some say he, didn't, he does not mention himself by name because he um, was modest and, 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 and didn't want to seem braggadocious, but uh, although he didn't use his name, he, I don't think he was very modest because uh, in, one, in John chapter 20 and verse number four, he refers to himself as the other disciple. And for some reason or another, he feels the need to tell us that he and Peter had a race after Jesus had arisen from the dead for some reason, he seemed the need to tell us that he and Peter raced to the sepulchre, to the cemetery, and he beat Peter in a race. He often refers to himself in the Gospel of John as the one, the disciple that Jesus loved. 
or the disciple that laid his head on Jesus' lap, shoulders, and Jesus loved. So John does not uh, positively identify himself as the author, but 100% of the theologians tell us that the other disciple of John here was, the disciple of John the Baptist was John the Apostle. Okay, verse 35. Again, the next day after, after John stood and two of his disciples. Get this now. He's talking about John the Apostle and Andrew. All right? They are standing there with their teacher, with their rabbi, if you will, uh, the one who had converted them to Christian. I mean, to what would become Christianity. Verse 36. And looking up upon Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Here's my first point. We see the preacher, the prophet, pointing to the Prince of Peace. John the baptizer continues to set the example, the model, for those of us who preach and pontificate the gospel of Jesus Christ. He continues to take the light off of himself and put it on the Christ. And, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said unto him, but he said, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. John the baptizer is saying to his disciples, John and Andrew, that's the one I've been preaching about. That's the one I've been teaching about. That's the one that Isaiah wrote about. That's the one that I told you that I am not worthy to, to reach down and type. That's the one that I have been telling you about. He continued to, to take the light off of himself. And there's a lesson there for all of us pastors, preachers, and teachers. We should never shine the light on us because Christianity and preaching the gospel is never about us. It's always about Jesus. It's always about him. These are John the baptizer's disciples, but John says, it's time for you all to leave me. It's time for you to stop focusing on me and start focusing on the master, on the prince of peace. He is decreasing so God can increase, so Jesus can increase. And that's the message to those of us who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ never, ever, ever, ever take credit for the gospel that we preach. We ought to continuously point people to Jesus the Christ. Pastor, great sermon. It's all about Jesus. I don't care how well you articulate. I don't care how well you uh, pontificate. I don't care how well you orally. I don't care how well you can hoop, how well you can teach. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus and and we need to learn how to do what John the baptizer did. Tell the people is not about me. Behold the Lamb of God. What does he do? He not only identifies the person, the Lamb of God, because every Jew would have been extremely familiar with the animal sacrifices. They would have been familiar with the morning and the evening, the daily burnt offering sacrifice, where they were required to sacrifice a a whole lamb. They would have been familiar with the Passover lamb that symbolized deliverance. So what is John saying? John is saying that's the one that died for you. I ain't died for you. Can't die for you. Or that's the one that's going to die for you. He said, behold, the lamb of God, look at him, follow him, obey him, love him, do what he says, do behold the lamb of God. And he gives him his purpose. He said, and the purpose is to take away the sin. Preach Betty Brown, older boy. His purpose is to take away the I'm not making it up. Behold the Lamb of God. Uh, 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 and, and, and what's his purpose? To take away the sins of the world. Behold the, what was the purpose of the Lamb? The Lamb was a substitutionary uh, offering for the sin. What is Jesus? Jesus is the real deal. He died. So if there's anybody that's watching me tonight, I want you to get out of that funk. I challenge you to get out of that pity party because of some sin you may have committed. Repent, turn it over to God and get on back. And Oh my God. And come on back to him. He says, behold, the lamb of God. Notice the I mean, the prophet uh, is pointing to the prince of peace. 
Behold, the Lamb of God, glory to God. Verse 37, and the two disciples heard him, who is him? Heard John, heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Here, here the, here's the point uh, under the first point under the prophet is continuously pointing to the Prince of Peace. You follow Jesus. Yes, yes, you follow the under shepherd as long as he's following the shepherd. Paul says, follow me if, as long as I follow Christ. But you cannot deviate from me if I deviate from Christ if you don't know the word. That's why it's important that you study to show yourself approved unto God. Rightly, oh, the workman need not be ashamed, but rightly divide the, bird, the, the, uh, the uh, rightly divide the word of truth. Mary Edwards, good evening to you. You need to know the word of God for yourself. So you can do like Paul said, if I deviate from the word, you deviate from me. That's why I challenge you, do your research. Devil, If uh, uh, once I get through teaching, go back and read it for yourself. Paul said to make sure that that which I tell you is correct. Fact check me. I double dog dare you to fact check me. I challenge you to fact check me. Miss Crawford, good evening to you. These two disciples of John the baptizer became Jesus's first disciples, which would ultimately start what would become the church. Test question, who were the first church members? Now, obviously the church, the word, uh, uh, the, 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 um, obviously uh, the, the first, the word Christian was not attached to them to, uh, over in Acts, but who, who made up what would become the church? Here it is right here. The disciples of John the Baptist who became disciples of Jesus the Christ, and they followed Jesus. If I deviate from Jesus, deviate from me. Glory to God. But you can't know if I'm deviating from him if you don't know the word. If you don't know the word. Ecclesia. Okay? Watch this. Verse number 38. We're still on the first point. The prophet is pointing. Then Jesus turned and saw them following. Everybody following him is not a disciple of here. A disciple of his is somebody that believes in him and is following him. Because we learn when we get John chapter 6, a whole lot of people were following him, but they, they were following him for, his, uh, for a handout and not for his heart. They were following him for what they could get out of him and not following him for who he was. Then Now, John the baptizer, these are his two disciples. And he's transforming them. He's pointing to the Prince of Peace. That's the one I need for you to follow now. Okay. Now, even after he, after he turned these over to Jesus, John continued to have disciples. Because remember when John was in jail, John sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? Remember the disciples of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray as John has taught his disciples to pray. So every disciple of Jesus did not become part of his personal ministry. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, of his, uh, yeah, uh, of his personal ministry. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto them, what you want? Now, now that seemed to be a strange question. That seems to be strange. Jesus see them following him, and Jesus asked the question, what do you want? <laughs> Glory to God. Can you imagine if somebody, if, if uh, it's good, even to you, can you imagine if the greeters at church, if the ushers at church Sunday, when you walked in and say, why are you here? But wouldn't that be, that's, that, that's really what Jesus asked. Why are you following me. Seems like they would have said, because our, our, our rabbi told him to follow you. Okay. But Je Jesus asked the question because he wanted to know their will. You need to know why people are following you. You need to know why people are clinging to you. You need to know every now and then, you need to ask those in your inner circle, why are we buddies? Why are we BFF? Why? why? What, what do you want? What's, what do you want from me? Why are you here? Why are we friends? Because everybody that's in your circle 
does not have your agenda or your best interest in mind. So Jesus said, I want to know what's your will. Why are you following me? Why, why, why are you going to church? Are you going because it's the social thing to do? Are you going because you want to meet the single men or you want to meet the single women? Are you going because you want the authority or the power or position? Or are you going to church because you want to learn more about him and to get closer to him and to engage in corporate worship? Why are you following Jesus? Are you seeking his hand only or are you seeking his heart? Why? I ask you again. Why are you following him? Why are you in church? Why are you in the choir? Why are you in ministry? Why are you in this clique? Why are you? Why, 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 why? Jesus asked, what do you see? What are you looking for? Because T.D. Jake said it this way. T.D. Jake said there are people who will get on board your train, Jehiah, because they like where you're going. They like the direction you're going. But oftentimes what happens is you are not getting there where they want to go quickly enough. So if somebody else comes, if another train comes heading in the same direction and is moving quicker, they'll jump off your train and get on, the, on, on their train because it wasn't about you in the first place. It was all about where you were going. And every now and then, you need to take inventory and say, why are you in my life? Glory to God. Jesus turned and saw them. John the baptizer had some disciples too. They were John the beloved and Andrew. And, and John the baptizer uh, uh, looks at Jesus and say, y'all need to follow him. And when they followed him, Jesus turned. Jesus turned around and said, what you seeking? And, and none of what they said unto him. They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to be interpreted master, they said, uh, um, um, uh, uh, where you living? <laughs> that seemed to be just as silly as Jesus said, what you seeking? Seemed like they would say, well, I'm following you because, I, because you know, uh, I want to know more about you. I'm following you because then that ain't what they said. They said, they said rabbi, rabbi, math teacher, master, all right, master. It depends on how the word rabbi is conjugated. Sometimes it means teacher and sometimes it means master. Obviously here it means master. Did they say master? It's now in order to call him master. That means I see myself as your slave, as your doulos, as your uh, Lord, Lord, Lord I, I, I am totally surrendered to your will. Oh, my God. Preach better, brown, older boy. I don't call you master unless I consider myself a slave. <laughs> my Lord, and a slave has no right. They are saying, Lord, we have total faith in you. You are the master. I am the slave. I'll go where you want me to go. Do what you want me to do. Say what you want me to say. Be what you want me to be. Robert Smith, good evening to you. They said, they said, Lord, where are you staying? Why? Why would they say that? I'm glad you asked. They asked him where uh, where where are you staying? Because basically what they're saying is, God, we Lord, we want some quiet, we want some quality time with you. We want to sit down with you. We want to know where you're living. So if we miss contact with you now, we'll know where you are tomorrow. We need some quality time. Can I ask you a question? When was the last time you had some quality time with him? What they were saying is, Lord, we want more than just a casual, hey Lord, bye Lord, we'll follow you lord we want to sit down lord we want to talk to you we want fellowship we want a fellowship with you and in order to do that we want to know where you stand because when we when you get away from the crowd we want to come see you we want to follow you we're going to go we got all the time in the world they are hungry for the word when you are hungry for the word of god you, oh, oh my God, thank, thank you, Holy Ghost. Check, check, check this out. You will go get what you're hungry for. If you're hungry for some hooping and hollering, you're going to go get some hooping and, ho and hollering. If you're hungry for some teaching, you're going to go get some teaching. If you're hungry for, for shot, ta, ta, you, you, whatever you are hungry for, that's what you will go and get. These guys were hungry to know more about Jesus. So they said, where are you staying? Because we want some quality time. That which you love, those who you love, you will spend quality time with people that you love. And the reason you're not spending quality time with the people that you say you love because you're lying, you don't love them. 
Monique, good evening to you tonight. The prophet is pointing to the prince of peace. Glory to God. He said, and notice what Jesus said in verse 39. I'm going to exegete the text. He says, come and see. <laughs> Look at that invitation. So John the baptizer has turned his two disciples over to Jesus. They following Jesus. Jesus turned around and said, what? What you want? They said, let her come. Uh, where are you living? Because we're going to quality time. They go home with him. Jesus said, come and see. And they said unto him, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 39. And he said unto them, come and see. In, in other words, come and experience me for yourself. Come and experience for yourself. I know you heard about me, but now come, come. He give them an invitation. They came and saw where he dwelt and stayed with him that day. And it was about four o'clock in the evening. They went and spent some quality time with the Lord. These become Jesus' first two disciples, which would ultimately become apostles, which would ultimately form the church, which would ultimately be uh, uh, form the body of Jesus or the universal church. But it all starts right here. This is where... It, the Jesus' disciples began, okay? There's, there's, uh, there's John the Beloved, and there is Andrew. How did they get come to Christ? The prophet kept pointing. Preachers, we got to keep pointing to him. Not about us. It's about Jesus, the Lamb of God, and him crucified. <clears throat> Point number two. After, so, so after... John and Andrew become disciples of Jesus. Point two, how they become disciples or followers? The prophet was pointing to the Prince of Peace. Point two, Peter is pursued and persuaded. Okay, pastor, exegete the text and show me where you see that. Who pursued him and persuaded him? His brother Andrew. Once Andrew got saved. I mean, well, he was already saved under, under, um, under John the Baptist. Teacher. Once he became a disciple, okay, once he became a disciple, once, once he became a disciple, now, now notice what Andrew does. Verse for, for number 40. And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, those of you who, who've been under my teaching, you know Peter had three names. His name is not Peter yet, but the reason John can call him Peter is because, because, because John writes um, uh, toward the end of the first century, uh, 30, I mean, 50, 60, 70, 80 years after the completion of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So, so Peter was already a pillar in the church when John wrote, okay? So that's why he can say Simon Peter. Okay, now, now notice what Andrew does, who had just become a follower of Jesus, after following John the Baptist. <laughs> oh my God. Follow me now. After following John the Baptist. And saw the prophet John the Baptist. Point to the Prince of Peace. Now Andrew now. Persuades. He pursues and, pers and persuades his brother. Check this out y'all. He first. He first. He first. Findeth his own brother. Simon. Simon is his Hebrew name. You will often hear him called Simon Bar Jonah or Simon Bar is Aramaic for son of Jonah is Aramaic for John. So often you will hear him called Simon, son of John. OK, that's his Hebrew name. Remember, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, translated from Hebrew into Greek, into a document called into a, some writing called the Septuagint, uh, and then translated from Greek to Latin to a document called the Latin Vulgate and etc. And then when it came on down to the English Bible. OK, but it started out with Hebrew. Simon is his Hebrew name. And he said unto him, we found the Messiah. The word Messiah is the Greek word for the Hebrew word. Um, um, Christ. I'm sorry. Messiah is the Hebrew word. Christ would be the Greek word. Christus. Okay. And, and it means the anointing. It, it's it's iterated, right which being interpreted the Christ. Christ is the Greek. Okay. Now notice what Andrew does. Verse 41. And he first findeth. He went and found his brother. 
being a disciple of Jesus, getting to know Jesus on an intimate level was so exciting to Andrew. Andrew said, I got to go find my brother and I got to go pursue him first. I'll find him. Then I got to persuade him. Oh, my God. To follow Jesus like I did. Whenever you get something good. Oh, my God. You want to share it with the people you love. But check this out. The hardest thing for us to do as believers is to witness to our family. And and one of the reasons is is difficult. Uh, Jesus said it this way. He said a prophet is without honor saving his own country. All right. But, but uh, uh, it, it's hard for people who know you, who knew you and know you to honor you as the changed person that you are. That's one reason. But more than likely, the reason is hard for us to deal. Let me just put this in your lap um, 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 and just keep it 100. Uh, the, the, uh, but the real reason that most of us can't influence our children and our sisters and our brothers and our aunties and our nieces and our nephew is because we are too comfortable allowing them to see the ungodly us. Let me say that again. The reason we cannot see uh, the reason uh, off time that we cannot witness and and be a light. You know, Jesus said you're a light world. The reason we can't be the light that we are supposed to be like Andrew is to his brother is because those of us who are saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. We are much too comfortable allowing our family to see us at our worst. We're not going to curse around church folk, but we're going to curse around our children. We're going to curse around our cousins. We're, gonna, we're not going to let the, um, uh, the church folks see us shake our booty. But when we get to the family gathering, we're going to shake our booty to the and wooty. And so then that hinders our witness and Mary Thomas. And so and and and, and then the third reason is difficult for us to uh, be a light for our uh, family folk. Glory to God. <laughs> oh, 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 my God. Is because they knew us back when and they don't want to believe that we changed. But most of us have become too comfortable. And I say, us. I'm not talking about y'all. I'm putting me in that category. We have become too comfortable with allowing our family members to see us at our ungodliest. And so they just, and, and, and then thirdly, it's hard for us to witness to them because now I'm falling. Now I don't fall in this category. I do fall in the other one. I'm going to do better. Y'all, y'all pray for me. But some of y'all, the, the, the reason some of y'all can't witness is because Christianity ain't working for you. You can't get them in the church because you too be the talking about the church. You can't get them to believe uh, 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 in the in the word of God because the word of God ain't working for you. It, it, they all the time see you broke, busted, disgusted, frustrated, aggravated, wooing me. Huh? You ain't never got any joy. And I say that the way I want to say it. You never have any peace. You always talking about I'm getting ready, getting ready, getting ready. The devil, you should be ready by now. They ought to see you have some joy sometime. You hate going to work. You hate your uh, you hate your marriage. You hate your job. You hate your church. You hate everything. Christianity ain't working for you, but yet you want your family family member to follow you into Christianity. Devil if, if, devil, if it ain't working for you, why I need to come over there? Now, some of us are in that category, but we're in that other category. We are much too comfortable allowing our, uh, our folk to see us ungodly. Glory to God. He says, he, he, the, he, he, he goes and he pursues his brother and he persuades his brother. Check Check out the text. I'm not going to leave it. That he first found his own brother Simon said to him, we have found the Messiah. We have found the one. We found the one. We found the one that our teacher taught us about. We found the one that our teacher told us was coming. We found the one that John the baptizer had been preaching about. We found him. And we fellowship with him. And I want you to come meet him. Some of y'all don't influence anybody. <laughs> Glory to God. You don't even, you can't even get your children to come to church and they still living under your roof. <laughs> Hello. Okay, let me go on. Point one, Andrew and John 
became disciples of Jesus because the prophet pointed to the Prince of Peace. Peter became, now, uh, let's go on verse, verse 42. And he brought him. Notice what he brought him. He said, man, let's, let, let's go see Jesus. Glory to God, beloved. That's the only word beloved from a Caucasian preacher. He said, and he brought him to Jesus. Notice how he influenced his brother. Who are you influencing? And good evening to you. Who are you? Are you influencing anybody? I'm talking about positive. I'm not talking about no, I'm not talking about no foolishness. Who are you influencing? He, he had, he lived in a way. So his brother, ask your question, Jehiah, and, and, and I'll try to answer. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, thou art Simon. That's Hebrew. Son of Jonah. John, how did he know his name? Jesus knew him. Jesus knew you before you knew, knew you before you knew yourself. He said, you are Simon, son of John. Aramaic. The, Jesus spoke Aramaic, but they, the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, fascinating part of Jesus spoke Aramaic, but they were, but they were recording in Greek. Okay. Thou art Simon. Now, if you know a thing about Simon, he was, ooh, oh my God. Thou shalt, thou shalt be called Cephas. So he changed his name. He's actually changing Simon's name from Simon to Cephas. Cephas is Aramaic. Okay? Jesus spoke Aramaic. I'm changing your name from Simon. I think Simon means unstable. Cephas means stone, rock. Okay? Uh, I'm going to ask Jehiah, I'm going to answer Jehiah question later so y'all uh, remind me of that. Thou art Simon, son of Jonah. <laughs> Thou shalt be called stone. He, he's, he's, he's pro, 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 prophesying. I'm trying to find the right word. He's prophesying. Not, he, he's not telling Peter what he is. Simon, what he is. Because he, Peter ain't stable. Simon ain't stable nowhere. He, he, he's not stable anywhere. Always flying off the handle. Wanting to cut somebody ear. Telling Jesus he ain't going to baptize him. Jumping off in the water. Talking about if it bids you, I'll come. He says, thou shalt be called stone. Now, Sunday we're preaching about Matthew 16 because that's where we are in our expository preaching where he's going to change his name from, from Cephas, which is Aramaic, to uh, Petros, which is Greek for stone. Same word. He's just using different languages, okay, which is interpreted as stone. Okay. All right. So that's Peter. All right, so how did Peter get saved? I mean, how did Peter become a disciple? Glory to God. His brother persuaded him to come to the Prince of Peace. So that's three people now are followers of Jesus. That's, that's uh, John, Andrew, which were disciples of John the Baptist. John pointed and they became disciples of Jesus. Andrew went and got Peter. And persuaded him to follow him. So now, and y'all know, Peter became not the rock, but he, he, he became um, um, the spokesperson for the 12. Point three, the prince of peace picked Philip. So not only did the prophet point, not only did Peter's brother persuade him to see the prince of peace, now we see the prince of peace Picking Philip, verse 43 through 44. The day following, Jesus, Jesus is his uh, Anglo-Saxon name. His real name would be Yeshua. Would go forth into Galilee. And he finds that Peter, and notice how he picked Peter. He said, not Peter, Philip. He said, follow me. Now, historians say Philip wasn't the bright above on the tree. Okay, and him calling Philip to be a part of his movement. Now, none of these people would have been called by a distinguished rabbi. And the message there is you don't have to be a star to be on God's show. You don't have to be great. You don't have to be. Now, there's a lie that we like to tell y'all that says God does not call the 
qualified, he qualified the call. That's a lie. God often calls qualified people. Matthew was well qualified uh, uh, to uh, handle the business. Now, does God call unqualified people? Yeah, but to suggest that God never calls qualified people is just a lie. Glory to God. There are a lot of you all, you were qualified to sing and, and God called you into the choir. You were qualified to be the treasurer of the church and God called you into that ministry. You were qualified to be a trustee so God called you into the ministry. You were qualified. You were qualified. You were qualified. So stop allowing people to make you think you got to be unqualified for God to use you. That's just a lie from the pits. Now, does he call unqualified people? Yes, he does. But he also calls qualified people and put them to work. Why would he call somebody to preach that stutters? I stutter, still stutter sometimes, but he called me. Glory to God. And if he can use me, he can use you. He calls Philip. You remember in John 14 where Jesus would give it his uh, 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 disciples uh, his almost his farewell address that not your heart be troubled, you've been God believe us. He, he said all that, and then Philip said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Philip raised his Lord, nobody know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to Philip, He said, Philip, <laughs> basically, Jesus said to him, Teresa, he, he said, You getting ready to graduate, and you still ask the elementary question. You getting ready to graduate. You've been with me for three and a half years, and you're still asking elementary questions. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That was Philip. But Jesus said, follow me. One of the mistakes I made as pastor is that, and I want to help somebody who may make the same mistake, is that I was looking for qualified people to put them in ministerial positions. I said, are you qualified? You know, do you have a degree? Do you did da, 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 da. And the Holy Spirit said to me, you need to get people that's available. Because oftentimes the most qualified people are not the most people, are not the people who will make themselves available. I can't use you if you're not there. So God says, no, you look at people who are there and you train them. You train them. Yes, I've given them the gift, but you got to stir up the gift. So I stopped looking for people to say, look, oh my God, you, you, you this, this, this. No, I said, oh no, you, you available. Can I teach you how to do that? Can I train you to do that? Because the greatest ability, because the greatest thing you can give to the church is your availability. Are you available? Because the anointing, the Holy Spirit, and some good teaching could teach you what to do. Even if you're at home, you can't help the church if you're at home. Stir up the gift. So God said, no, you just find people that's available. Find people that's there. Glory to God. Verse number 44. Okay. So he, 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 he calls Philip. He, he picks Philip. And God wants to pick you. You don't have to be qualified. But you can be. <laughs> God says this all to tell you. If you got a bad driving record, you can't drive a church van. If you've been stealing money in your past, you can't be on the finance committee. But we'll find something for you to do. If you got bad feet, you can't be a usher. But we'll find a place for you. A lady joined my, uh, MTV several years ago, and she said to me, she said, this church is territorial. I said, it really is, but if you're available, we'll expand the territory. Preach, boy. <laughs> oh, my God. She said, this church is territorial. I said, it is real territorial. But if you are available, we will expand the territory. Are you available? Lord, I'm available to you. Okay. All right. Now, let me get to this last point. Number one. So now we have four people following him. We got... Uh, Andrew and John, who were disciples of John the Baptist first. We got Andrew's brother, Peter. And now we have Philip, okay? John the Baptist, the prophet, was pointing. That's how the first two came. Peter's brother persuaded him to come. And Jesus handpicked Philip. One more, okay? Verse number 43. Philip persuades Nathaniel 
to come. Watch this. And the day following, I'm sorry. Now, Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So they were all from the same town. My God. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, check this out, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, I think Philip went a little too far. I think Philip should have stopped right there where he said, we find in Nathanael and said unto him, we have found him whom Moses wrote in the law and the prophets who Moses in the law and the prophet did right because he's going to mess uh, Nathaniel up, which is called Bartholomew in the synoptic gospels because he says that we found the one and he's from Nazareth. Got to understand uh, Nathaniel or Bartholomew obviously was educated in the Torah, in the Jewish law, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. Okay, you know, the Hebrew Bible is called the Tanakh. <laughs> and, they, uh, and, and, and everyone pronounced it, they said Tanakh. You know, T-N-K for the, uh, um, um, that's, that's the Hebrew Bible. It's called the Tanakh, the, the uh, Torah, the uh, N for the Nibian, and the K for the Kativan. Okay, the, 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 the law, the prophets, and the writings. Okay, so he was familiar with the law. All right, he was familiar with the, and, and, and so here, um, Philip said to him, no. And then Nathaniel said in verse 46, he says, wait a minute. You trying to tell me that you found the Messiah and the Messiah came from Nazareth? He said, man, we look down on the Nazarite. No good thing. No, he asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That we see the prejudice that they had against the Nazarenes. Philip said unto him, same thing Jesus said, come see for yourself. Don't argue with people about the word. Tell them, say, experience him for yourself. You will never win anybody to Christ arguing with them. You will never win anybody to Christ. In my, no, rarely will you, I'm not going to say never. Rarely when you, will you win, win anybody to Christ with John the Baptist's te technique. This fire and brimstone, go to hell if you don't change. Rarely. Nathaniel said, can any good, say, man, you chucking and jiving me, can any good thing come from Nazareth? <laughs> the answer is, yeah. Now, Jesus was born in Bethlehem and moved to Nazareth, okay? But he was born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth, okay? Um, Philip said, come see for yourself. Now, here, here's what you can always do when you're witnessing. You, you can tell people, see for yourself. Because Christianity is working for me. And am I always up? No, I have spirit, I have spirit, I have spirit seasons of depression. That does that make me less than a saint? No, that makes me human. I have good days, I have bad days. Does that make me less than a saint? No, it makes me human. There, there are sometimes I'm full of faith. There are sometimes I got some doubt. Does that make me less than a saint? No, that makes me human. Glory to God. But, but Christianity is working for me. I have some good days. Oh my God, some really good days. Some, 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 some days where I'm full of joy. Some, 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 some days where I just uh, love light. I love God. I love my family. I love my children. I have some great days. Christianity is working for me. Go to church. Every Sunday when I'm the pastor, I'm going to got to be there. Pay my tithe. <laughs> Glory to God. Love my, uh, 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 check on my people. Teach the word. It is, it, it, and, and so if Christianity is working for you, then you can tell somebody. Come see for yourself. If you are getting fed at your church, you can tell somebody. Come see for yourself. If the Bible study is helping you, you can tell somebody, listen to listen for yourself. I ain't got to argue with you. Listen for yourself and draw your own conclusion. You just point people to Jesus and let God do the rest. 
It's not your job to clean the fish. You just catch them. Let God clean them. It's not your job to set the people in order. That's God's job. Tell them, come see. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming, 47, 47, to him and said unto him, he said, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no dishonesty. In other words, he said, I peeped your card, Nathaniel. You are an honest man. You are an honest man. There is no dishonesty in you. If it comes up, it's going to come out. Nathaniel said unto him, how you know me? <laughs> oh, God. Nathaniel said, how you know I'm an Israelite? And how you know I'm an honest man? And Jesus answered me and said, behold, look, that he said, before Philip came and found you, when that was under the fig, now the fig, now under the fig tree is symbolic in Judaism of, of somebody's quiet place where they are genuinely praying and meditating on scripture. So what Jesus is saying is before Philip, you thought no one know where you were, where your quiet place is. And, it, and everybody and all of us need a quiet place. We need a quiet place where we can go along and read and meditate and just talk to God. He says, I saw you in your quiet place before Philip even got to you. I saw you in your quiet place. You thought nobody saw you. He says, I saw you. I saw, and, and may I remind all of us, he sees us. And not only does he see us when we're doing bad, he sees us when we're doing good. Jesus sees you in your quiet time. He sees you in your meditation time. And he's going to honor you for that. Glory to God. He said, I, he said, he said, I saw you under the tree. Notice, notice how specific he gets. I saw you under the tree in your quiet time. Nathaniel said unto him, Rabbi, he said, thou art the son of God. Wait a minute. Thou art, thou art the king of Israel. I know you are the one who they said you are. There's something very interesting here that, that I, I really have time to, to get in tonight. Simon, um, now Andrew called him the Messiah. Nathaniel just called him the son of God. But yet Jesus waits until Matthew 16 when Peter declares it. Does he build his church on him? Okay. Okay. Teresa said Nathaniel was the first one to testify of, 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 of him. Uh, Andrew had already testified of him. Andrew said, um, we found the Messiah. So uh, Nathaniel would have been the second. But you're right, um, Teresa. Uh, Andrew, I mean, uh, Nathaniel was the, the first one to say you son of God. Okay. Um, let's go back. Um, and finish this. Um, Nathan said unto him, Rabbi, da, 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 verse 50, Jesus said unto him, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the tree, believe thou. He said, you impressed by that? <laughs> he said, that impressed you? He said, you ain't seen, and excuse my language, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> oh, God. He says unto him, he said, Andrew, you think that's cool? He said, he he said unto him, Bird of I said unto you, He hath that you shall see heaven open, and the angel come down of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He says, He says, You're going to see what Jacob wanted to see. I, I am the gap between God, I am the mediator between God and man. He says, In other words, excuse my language, you ain't seen nothing yet, Philip. I'm sorry, Nathaniel. You ain't seen nothing. You're going to see me walk on water. You're going, you think me knowing that you were under the tree in your private meditation something, you're going to see me feed 5,000 with a few fish. You're going to see me walk on water. You're going to see me raise ladder from the dead. You're going to see me heal the sick. You're, go, you're going to see. You're going. The best is yet to come. Can I help somebody? The best is yet to come. And I'm not talking about financially. I'm not talking only. I'm not because 
because soon the preachers say the best is yet to come, then y'all get excited about your mysterious stuff, your material stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the best is yet to come. God is going to show you great things. God is going to reveal things into the in, in, in your spirit by revelation. You think what you've seen now is something God you are going to see God really work. Will it uh, in, will it uh, uh, also include material stuff? Yes, yeah. but stop seeking only spiritual stuff. We need to start seeking to get closer to him, to learn more of him and watch him start giving us revelation. You want a new job? God will show you where the new job is. You want a new house? Get closer to him and he will show you where to get the house. If whatever you want from God as it relates to material things, you get them by seeking him. Matthew 6, he said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Glory to God. That's it. The first five disciples. Now, I've got to do two more things. So y'all stay with me. Now, these are the first disciples of Jesus that will ultimately make up the church. Now, go to Mark chapter number one. Well, I can take longer than an hour. Where's my broadcast? Glory to God. Turn to Mark chapter number one. We need to stop seeking his hand. We found his hand. Now let's look for his heart. Glory to God. We need to... We, uh, Mark, Mark, Mark chapter one, because I, I need to show you something, because... This is kind of controversial. Um, Mark chapter 1. Uh, da, 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 da. Here it is. Um, check this out. Uh, verse number 16. Now, as he walked by the sea, meaning Jesus, of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting their nest into the sea, for they were fishes. Same Simon, same Andrew. Okay? Okay, now you, you ought to know Simon is Peter, Andrew is his brother. How did they first become disciples? They were disciples of John the Baptist. You, you see how, how teaching can hook stuff up here? They were disciples of John the Baptist. John the Baptist transferred them to Jesus. Okay, they were casting their nests into the sea, for they were fishers. Well, wait, wait, Pastor, I thought God had already called them to follow him. God did call them, but God did not call them in, in uh, John chapter 1, to be a part of his personal ministry and leave everything behind. See, every disciple were not chosen to be in his inner circle. Oh my God. Every, he only chose 12. And he had not yet chosen Andrew and Peter to leave everything and follow him. He had chosen them to follow him, to be his disciples, but not to leave everything. So when, so when P, Peter and Andrew left him, they went back to work. Now he's getting ready to call them to be in his inner circle. And there's a lesson there. I don't have time to talk about it tonight. Pastors, be careful how you put people in your inner, in your inner ministry circle. Everybody not designed to be in your inner ministry circle. And Jesus said unto them, come ye after me. Well, I thought you already told him that. He did. He told him to come after him and follow him and become his student and become his disciple. He didn't tell them to drop everything. So they didn't go back to work. They stayed where they were. They stayed where they were, and then they went back to work. So that's so this is how you explain this. They are not two different, uh, uh, they don't contradict itself. Okay? And and uh, come after me, and I will make you to become pictures of men. Check this out. And straight away they fought, they forsook their nest and followed him. And when he had gone a little further hint, he saw James, etc., etc., etc. So those aren't contradictory. Okay, one, he was calling them to become a, a, a disciples, but not to leave everything and go with him on his three and a half year journey. Now he's calling them to leave everything because he's going to ultimately move them from discipleship to apostleship. Glory to God. They will ultimately become apostles. Now, Jehiah asked the question, I think it was something about, um, do you have to go to church? The answer is, uh, what's the answer? Do you have to go to church? Let me answer it like this. There's one verse in the Bible. That's Hebrews chapter, what is it? I used to know where it was. Uh, says, forsake not the, forsake not the gathering 
of yourselves together as some have forsaken. So, Jesus, so the writer of the Hebrews tell us to assemble ourselves together. Now, most of us, when we join a church, and, and, and I mean a body, we commit ourselves to the rules and regulations of the church. Every Christian, uh, thank you, Tanya, Hebrew 10, 10, 25. Every Christian entity up until the modern day knew that church going was important. David said this. He says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go in the house of the Lord. Right. David said, I got excited about going to the house of God. So the answer is, yes, we need to go to church. We should be in the church because Paul compared the church to a body. You got some eyes, some ears, some nose, some feet, some legs. And you are supposed to be an integral part of that body. How can the body move when you the eye, when you the toes, when 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 you the toes and and um the church crippled because you at home talking about I ain't got to go to church. Now, do you have to go to church to be saved? No, you have to go to church to be obedient. Is everybody not going to the church going to hell? No. There are a lot of folk ain't going to church going to heaven because they believe in Jesus Christ. And there are a lot of folk going to church every Sunday going to bust hell wide open. So going to church is not the big all get off. Only you ought to go to church only if you're going for the right reason. And that's to gain not now knowledge, information and corporate worship. Knowledge, information, and corporate. Now, let me be fair. I don't know how the Lord is going to deal with social media. I don't know that. I would like to think if Jesus were here on earth today, he wouldn't ride a camel he would, and, and he had to preach in California. He wouldn't ride a camel. He wouldn't walk. He would get on an airplane. I would like to think because we have modern bathroom. Jesus would not, Jesus would use the modern bathroom and, and wouldn't just use the bathroom in, 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 in the wood. I would like to think that Jesus would have no problem riding in cars. So I don't know how Jesus is going to deal with the social media. I don't know. And I don't propose to know. But what I do know is this, that some of you, some of you who used to have a yearning and burning and love for the fellowship of the brethren have lost your first love. You don't desire to go to church anymore. You can stay. I mean, you, you just don't care. And those are the people that I'm trying to get back in church. Those of you who used to have a burning and a love for the choir, a love for the for, for to, to be there. Now, check check this out, and I'm through. This last week, I'm gonna answer it. Why do people th say? I don't have to go to church. I can watch it on TV or YouTube, but yet they can they can tune in to the club on YouTube, but they don't. They can tune in to their games on YouTube and on Facebook, but they don't. You, and you know why you don't? Because you like the atmosphere of the club. Because you like the atmosphere of the game. That's why y'all go to church, because... We like the atmosphere. <laughs> oh, my God. Now, do you have to go to church to be saved? No. No, no. No, you can make it in. You, you, you can make it in and never set foot in a, in a church because you're going to be saved by your love of Jesus Christ. But if you love, it, but if you love Jesus, you ought to love his house. Okay? God bless y'all. That's it. Uh, John chapter number two. Next week. You're right, Tanya. There's just something about when I go to the race, I haven't gone to the Razorback game in years, but, but, but when I go to the Razorback game to see 50,000 people, um, 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 Jehiah, in it, you know, I mean, in it, and I don't want to say any excuse to do, but and I'm not going to get personal tonight, but I mean, any excuse would do for, uh, for anybody. Some folk ain't got no stocking, so, uh, so, so, so that way they don't come. Uh, some folks stayed out too late. I mean, what I'm saying is you can make any excuse not to do just like you can find a reason to do. And I'm not talking about you particularly, I'm talking about us. 
I'm addressing us. You can find and you can find a reason not to do anything, but you can also find a reason to do. Okay, all right. It just depends on what your desire is. Most people who make excuses not going to church don't want to come, and that's cool. Don't come. I'm not, I'm not talking about you in particular. I'm doing general. Don't 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 come. But for those of you who were taught better, and those of you who know better, get in somebody's church. God bless you. That's it for tonight. Tanya will be teaching tomorrow night on MTV's Facebook page. I'm still looking for. I got about. I got ten people so far that has pledged um, uh, $100 to the church anniversary. I need, I'm looking for 90 more, 90 more people to pledge. I'm trying to, I, um, I'm, I don't ask for money very often on these broadcasts. Uh, matter of fact, I rarely do, but um, we, we, I'm trying, we're trying to raise $10,000 to pay for this new air conditioned unit that we just bought. Um, I need, I got 10 people. Thank those of you who have pledged. Uh, uh, don't hold both in ministry, okay? And, I, and I'm not fussing, but if this ministry is a blessing to you, uh, please, ma'am, pl and please, I'm telling you where the money going. No, I'm not telling you if you give me $100, God going to give you $10,000. i am saying if, 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 if you get a church $100 uh, in January, uh, when you get to write your taxes, you, you, you can write it off. And that's all I'm promising you. <laughs> y'all know I'm cuckoo. God bless y'all. I uh, love you. Uh, um, 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 once again, uh, hit me up. If you want to play the $100, uh, all right, that's my netter. So now I uh, got 90. So that's 11 people now. I only need 89 more. Okay. Uh, God bless y'all. May it keep you is my prayer. Peace, y'all.